Good morning, my name is Renee Fry, and my husband Tony and I, along with our children, Logan and Mahala, have been a part of the New Heights community, or the faith community, for about three or four years now. We've been blessed to be here with the people and um, be involved with worship on Sunday mornings and be a participating in family faith night, confirmation, and I also am privileged to be able to teach uh, preschool downstairs at the Glory Bees um, school that we have here at New Heights as well. Um, and thinking over memories and thoughts of what my faith story means to me when Pastor Rob asked if I would share my faith story, um, I came up with lots of ways that God connects me to him through music, nature, friends, um, scripture, of course. But the key thing that I think about is the relationships that he's put in my life and built into um, my everyday experience. And so I guess I have to go back to the beginning of my story. My faith story really begins when I was born. Uh, my parents were living in Palmyra, Wisconsin, which is over by Fort Atkinson and Whitewater. And they were attending worship services regularly at the United Methodist Church in town. And that's where I was baptized. My mom belonged to a Bible study group there. And at that time, they gave her a little gift for me to have someday. They gave a little silver cross, um, a necklace. And I can remember being a little girl and looking at it on my dresser and thinking, wow, when will I be old enough to wear that? Because it was so pretty and I just thought it was so special. And when I did finally grow up and got big enough to be able to wear it, uh, it's something that I wear often. And I also am wearing it today because it taught me that before I was even here on earth, there was a group of people that worshiped together with my family, that cared about my family, shared their joys, and wanted to pass that belief and faith in God onto me before I was even here. When I was a year and a half old, we moved to Oregon, Wisconsin, which is also not very far from here. And this is where I did all my growing up, my growing up years. My friends used to affectionately call us the Cleaver family, as in Ward and June and Wally and the Beeve, um, because it was a very traditional family. And we had a lot of fun together. We had a genuine love for each other. Um, we said prayers at mealtimes. We prayed at bedtime. And even though we didn't have regular devotions, we knew that, and I knew, that God was the center of everything that we believed in and did. My relationship with my dad has always been pretty special. I've always seen him as my protector, my teacher, my friend, my guide to life's lessons. And because of that relationship, I always feel that way about my father in heaven as well. Um, he is my protector, my cheerleader, my safe place. And my mother also shared a lot of those roles in my life or modeled a lot of those roles in, the, in my life that way. She also was a perfect example of loving service to others and true beauty of the heart. We had lots of fun together and I saw my parents as a great team. They respected each other and they were great examples of how you serve people in your community and serve people in your family. I was also blessed to know, know that my grandparents were also um, involved on a regular basis with their worship communities. And they lived not very far away, so we had the opportunity to go and visit pretty often on a regular basis. And when we went, we always went to worship with them. And I remember it was pretty common whenever we would go on a Sunday morning to church with grandpas and grandmas that we would be asked to sing as a family because our family was pretty musical. And so it felt like we were the Von Trapp family singers, um, only about half the size <laughs> of what that is. Um, back at home, we were members at People's United Methodist Church, and the people there were like family to me. I looked forward to Sundays along with Wednesday evenings when my parents would go to choir practice and the kids all got together and played in the basement and had fun. My favorite part was the peace time, much like here at New Heights when people would get up and move around and when they would offer the peace of God, but they would also uh, give lots of hugs and share the joy of the morning with each other. But my absolute favorite thing about my church growing up was at the end of our services when we would have our closing hymn and our organist would play and our choir director would also play the piano at the same time, and they just had a way of making the music so special. And it was such a glorious sound with our little church full of singing and music reaching up to heaven. It was literally like the ceiling roof lifted right off of the building, and you could see right up into heaven. And my heart felt so close to God there. It was through these people in my church and my parents and my brother and all those foundational people in my life that my faith started to form. And then I went away to college. 
And when I was at UW Platteville, I didn't have a, a worship community to be a part of. Um, I did attend church a few times at a Catholic church because it was right on the edge of campus and I could walk there. But it wasn't a regular attendance thing because I was usually out of town on Saturdays running and cross country and track meets. So Sundays became my day to catch up on homework and do laundry. But even though I was missing a community of believers to be with, I also still felt really close to God in my heart. And I was blessed to have um, an invitation to become a part of a group while I was on campus called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I went there because a friend invited me, and it was a very small group. Um, and we met on a weeknight, which worked better with my schedule. And through them, I started to explore my relationship with God and my personal beliefs outside of a faith community. So it became more real to me, and it became more um, at a mature level. And they also gave me a gift, which is my current Bible that I use. At the time when I was going to these meetings, I still had my Good News Bible that I had gotten from my third grade um, Bible presentation in in church, and while that was a great Bible and a great start, they wanted me to be able to know more about what I was reading about, so they got me a student Bible. And it was one of the nicest gifts I've ever received, and I still think about those people when I open that Bible and I read the scriptures. It was also in Platteville that I met my best gift in life, my husband, Tony, and this began a new chapter in my faith journey. Tony came from a Catholic upbringing, also having been very involved in his home parish, through our early years of getting to know each other, we attended services in both of our hometowns. But when it became clear that we wanted to get married, we weren't sure what we were going to do with our worship experience because neither one of us really felt strongly about becoming Catholic or Methodist. We um, knew that we wanted to build our relationship on God, but we decided that Ultimately, it didn't matter where we ended up. It just needed to be a place where we both felt like we could continue to grow in our relationship with God and worship God and serve together with the community. So we waited till we got married, and then that led us to St. Martin's Lutheran Church in Cross Plains, just down the road. We got involved and fell in love with the people at St. Martin's, and we could feel the Holy Spirit moving through that place. We sang in choir. We were youth group leaders. We took classes and were very involved with our Bible study groups, both men and women's. And we joked that if we didn't have a life at church, we wouldn't have had a life at all because that's where we spent most of our time. Each of those relationships grew our faith deeper. And I really thought that we'd be there forever. But more on that in a little while. During this time, we became parents for the first time. And that is when I felt a closeness to God that I'd never experienced. Holding my son for the first time, so tiny and perfect from heaven. It was what I'd always wanted, to be a mom. And then I found out what it was like to be a mom of a baby with colic. <laughs> Anybody else have a baby with colic out there? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stress involved with having a colicky baby. Um, and there were many times then and even now when they hit the teenage years that I would shake my head and look at the sky and say, really, God, couldn't you have sent him with a manual so I could know what to do to help this little person. But life continued on, and we made our way through the colicky phase, and we watched in wonder as our sweet little boy learned about God and Jesus through our faith community and family traditions. I think there's something so special and amazing about teaching little people about a faith in God. Logan would come home from church, and he would lead worship with his little microphone and his electric drum and his guitar, and he would also teach children's sermons to us after Pastor Rod had taught that morning. And his innocence and pure joy for worship and music was just so awesome to see. It was a huge blessing then, and it continues to be today. I remember when my grandma passed away, and Logan was still pretty little. And we, of course, were all crying because we were sad knowing that we weren't going to see her for a while until we all get to heaven someday. And Logan looked up at me with a really confused face, and he said, Mom, why are you crying? He said, Gigi is in heaven, and she can dance again, and her legs work, and she can walk. And I was totally blown away by his strength of faith and what we had already been teaching him at such a young age. Life was good, and even in the stress of juggling jobs and parenthood, we felt confident in our faith journey and mission of St. Martin's. We felt like we were right where God wanted us to be. 
we were blessed to find out we were going to have another child. Um, there were different challenges, however, this time around, which led to me being put on bed rest for nine and a half weeks. It meant I had to quit my teaching job. Tony had to work full time and do most of the care for Logan and keep up with the house. And while my time on the couch did give me more time to read and think and pray, there were also moments when I just felt useless and frustrated, when I just wanted to be a mom. <sighs> to my little boy, who couldn't understand why I wasn't able to play like normal. We had an awesome support network from our church and from the school where I was teaching. People came to visit and bring meals, which was a huge help and a sign of God working through others. We felt loved and cared for by so many. And while I was scared about the unknown of how things would turn out with the pregnancy, just as in the past, I still had a sense of peace and feeling that God's hand was in everything. After all of the challenges of our beautiful daughter, she arrived safely and we thought we had been stressed out before. Ha! <laughs> we made the decision to move back to Cross Plains to be nearer to our faith community. We put our house on the market, decided to build a new house, which added more stress. And add to it a baby that couldn't sleep, and a four-year-old who was used to being the center of attention and had to deal with moving out of his house. And I was starting to lose confidence in who I was. I was hitting a breaking point. I was trying to just reach out to God, but honestly just exhausted and mostly sending up prayers of desperation. I vividly remember one night as I was holding my daughter who was crying and wouldn't go back to sleep. I completely hit rock bottom, and I cried out at the ceiling, Jesus, I can't do this anymore. Take it. Please just take it. And I instantly felt at peace, and I could regain my composure and rock my little girl back to sleep. I knew in that moment, clearer than I had any time in my life, that the Holy Spirit had saved me. And then came the big whammy, as we call it. We received a letter in the mail explaining that our beloved friend and pastor would be leaving St. Martin's. It wasn't your typical departure from church. There were a lot of circumstances that were swirling around it, and Tony happened to be on council at the time, which brought with it many painful responsibilities. We were devastated by the fallout that followed as we all tried to call a new pastor. People who'd been like family to us were suddenly on different sides. There was resentment, there was anger, and broken relationships. It became almost impossible for us to go to worship as we felt horrible every time we were there. I personally struggled with mean and unloving thoughts toward people I considered to be really good friends and good people. I doubted my faith, wondered what I did wrong, wondering if this was God's plan or was it the work of the devil, or wondering if we just needed to be more loving and open and decide to be happy. You know, and growing up, we had always had change of pastors and nothing like this had ever happened in my life. Um, each person brought new blessings to our church and we never once considered leaving our, our home parish. But here we were considering leaving St. Martin's and I think that Tony and I felt like failures and that God was disappointed in us. I felt ashamed of all the pettiness and nasty feelings that were inside and I wanted God's guidance, but I didn't know what to do. It was an extremely difficult time in our lives. And finally, one morning, we gave in to the urge to come to New Heights instead of going to St. Martin's. And we walked through that door over here, and it felt like we were almost cheating, <laughs> going to a different place. But from the moment we walked in, we felt joyful and at peace. And that would be nice if I could tell you that was the end of the story and how we made our way to New Heights. But of course, being the indecisive people that we are, we couldn't decide whether we were supposed to stay at St. Martin's or come to New Heights. So we spent two long years being a part of two parishes, trying to keep up with everything. I personally felt like I was welcomed here at New Heights, and 
I loved being here, but I still had relationships at St. Martin's that I couldn't imagine replacing. I was hesitant to commit to anything real here at New Heights for fear of losing so much again. We kept praying and waiting for some big sign about where we were supposed to, to be. And I felt lonely and pretty much resigned to the fact that we could be a part of God's Holy Spirit moving through this place, but that I would never really have true relationships again. It felt a lot like wandering in the desert, probably because we were slow to be open and vulnerable to let God begin to heal our hearts. I don't know if it was God's nudging or if it was just us finally making a decision, but we finally decided that we wanted to be a part of what was happening here at New Heights, and we made the decision to leave St. Martin's and follow our hearts. Our children's faith has grown by leaps and bounds in what we'd seen here, and our own faith had been deepened by what was going on here. And so with time, we decided to jump in and wholeheartedly embrace what was going on here. And one day I was sitting in communion, and it hit me as I was looking at people walking up and coming back down that God had blessed me with a connection in this place, a connection that I didn't think that I would get again. I realized that I loved the people that I was with and that I did feel like I belonged here. And it was wonderful to feel that blessing from God. Which leads me to a couple of days here with our New Heights community when God spoke to me as, as loudly as he ever has before. As I mentioned earlier, I came to a point in my life that I very much doubted my capabilities as a parent and a competent person in life. It's really hard to put into words, but even though I knew I was loved and valued and I have purpose, I still just felt like I couldn't do anything right. I felt like everyone else could do it better. And I felt like I was always being judged about my abilities or lack of abilities. And I tried to tell the devil to get behind me and <laughs> ignore it, but I still was struggling. So on a Sunday morning, we came to worship, and Pastor Rob delivered a sermon based off of a scripture from the, chap the book of Luke, chapter 7. It was a story of a sinful woman who came to a party uninvited, breaking all the social rules just to get to Jesus. She wept, and she washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, and then she poured out expensive perfume on them. And I love this story. I've always loved this story because it shows the great love that Jesus has and the forgiveness that Jesus gives us. But it also shows how our hearts are changed in response to that great love. But the personal connection that I have to the scripture and that I was thinking about on that morning was that my brother once wrote a letter to me telling me how I remind him of that woman because I love extravagantly and give of myself in serving others. He told me that he wished he was more like me in that way. It was one of the nicest things anyone's ever said. And it meant so much to hear them from my brother because I feel that way about him and always think that he's a better and smarter person than me. So to hear that he admired me for something was truly a gift. Also on this morning, after this sermon, a woman from our congregation who is a good friend pulled me aside, just out of the blue, and she told me how she admired the type of mom that I am and the person that I am. She told me all these wonderful qualities that she sees in me, including how I love and serve others. I was grateful for her kind words, all, all the while thinking, how can you be saying this about me when I think this about you all the time? <laughs> um, I would never have said those words to myself, but God used her and allowed me to hear them from her. And it was a huge blessing to me. 
So I went home thinking, wow, that's really cool. I had to be here to hear all these things and see them come together. And the next morning, I felt compelled to pull out an old book that my sister-in-law had given to me as a gift years before. It was a book written by Beth Moore. I don't know if any of you have done a Beth Moore study, but um, my sister-in-law was really excited about what this woman had to say. And the book was called Jesus, the One and Only. And when I received the book, I had... um, not heard about Beth Moore, never done one of her studies. So while I was on bed rest, I tried reading it. And it just wasn't speaking to my heart. I mean, it was good material. I mean, it's about Jesus. It has to be good, right? But but it wasn't something that I could hear in my head and connect it to my heart and really feel like I was getting into it. So I didn't finish the book. I put it aside. But on this particular morning, for some reason, I felt compelled to pick it up again. And then having seen that it was Beth Moore at this point in my life, I had been a part of a study, several studies here with the New Heights Women's Group, and had fallen in love with Beth Moore and her ministry and her testimonies and loved, loved listening to her speak. And when I picked up that book that morning, I could hear her voice and I could see her expressions and it totally came alive for me. (laughs) The most exciting part about the book when I opened it that morning was that the scripture verse at the top of the page was Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, and it was entitled, Loving Much. And my heart practically jumped out of my chest as I realized that's the very same scripture from the day before that Pastor Rob had spoken about. And I felt the warmth of the Holy Spirit wash over me as I started reading. It came to life for me, and I was really excited about what God was doing. It was amazing to me that he had taken so many different places from my life in different spots and put them together in that one moment. After I finished reading the chapter, I turned my attention to the bookmark that had held the place in the book. (laughs) It had an inspirational message about being in the moment and believing in myself, which was the true kicker, because I had so much self-doubt. And as I flipped it over and found that it was from my best friend from college, she had written a note for me on the back. And she had written a message to me that said, read these words as a reminder of all that you do but remember that you can't do it all. And I just sat on the couch and I just cried happy tears of joy and amazement and disbelief. And I looked up at heaven and I said, God, you connected all the dots. (laughs) You brought it all together. He somehow knew that I was ready to hear that message that day. And he used so many people and so many avenues to get it delivered to me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. I thank you for the people that you bring into our lives to support us, teach us, and love us. And I thank you for the ways that you surprise us when we least expect it, just to remind us of your deep and abiding love for us. Thank you that learning about faith in you is a lifelong journey and we're all on it together. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, we are never alone. In Jesus' name, amen.